second. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Sharoshi, and this is uh, Stories from the Frontlines, a live video series at Drug Reporter. The aim of this uh, series is to give voice to those activists, uh, professionals, and peers who are working in the front lines of harm reduction and see how uh, programs uh, respond to this crisis. Uh, today, I have uh, three guests uh, with me from uh, Portugal. Uh, Adriana Curado from uh, GAT, uh, a harm reduction organization based in Lisbon. Uh, Jose Queiroz from uh, Abdesh, uh, an organization based in uh, Porto, and uh, Hui Corinda Morai from uh, CASO, the Portuguese group of uh, people who use drugs, and he's uh, joining us from uh, uh, Vizio. So we have three people from three organizations, three uh, cities, and hope three different uh, perspectives on things. Uh, good afternoon, bom dia. Bom dia. Hi, bom dia. <laughs> So the, the media reported that uh, Portugal has been performing better than most of its neighbors in this uh, crisis or managing this epidemic, let's say. So the, uh, the, the story was much better than, for example, in, in, in Spain. So and, and now you are starting uh, uh, what you call, uh, sorry for my Portuguese pronunciation, disconfinamento, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's well like... Done. It's like easing the lockdown measures. So do you agree that uh, in Portugal, in, in general, it was a better management of, uh, of this epidemic than in, in neighboring countries? Uh, I don't know. Can I start in a general yes. way? So, okay, thank you. So it's only to say that from my perspective, I think that uh, in general, the health um, Portuguese system has, you know, proven and shown that the, that we have very capable professionals and that they don't they were they are able and they were capable to sacrifice themselves and to work uh, in the front line you know and we can consider the front line i think in this particular case is the hospital the hospitals the streets the health unit everywhere where medical doctors and nurses and psychologists and social workers and peers you know were facing uh, the covid and they were facing this pandemic and this quite is this quite interesting? And then I will sh shut up myself, because you are we are seeing that um, a health system to, that was being attacked, and honestly, that that was being under pressure in the last, I would say, ten years, um, by the neoliberal economical approach, and that was you know being um, withdraw, being withdraw of money and resources, and not being you know properly. Um, um, a campaign by the Portuguese government and by the politicians in general. I, th I think that he has, you know, he has shown to all of us, to society in general, that this is one of the main pillars of a democratic society, to have a public health system that can reach everyone and that, you know, can be, you know, um, uh, the last and the, the last support that can still sustain people's lives. So for me, that was a very important thing that we can could learn and can learn with this COVID crisis in general. Okay. The others, do you have any anything to add to this, like the general picture? Well, um, I, I could say that uh, um, on the more uh, uh, micro level, on the streets, uh, I feel that uh, civil society moved uh, uh, pretty quickly and mobilized, and uh, I saw this kind of... Uh, uh, energy beyond uh, limits because uh, especially arm reduction was under a lot of pressure and uh, chronically disinvested and uh, so so I, I saw kind of uh, real real people giving the best to keep services and uh, uh, OST programs running and people assessing uh, at least a minimum uh, care and uh, so globally i think it uh, it was uh, great to see this mobilizing and uh, seeing all all teams and all projects coming together uh, uh, it was uh, it was energizing but uh, at the same time i think that the state is still very slow moving and this is in fact asking some of their own uh, uh, things they, sh they should do they are asking civil society that they have 
chronically non, not invested and uh, on top they are asking civil society to you know continue to be like superheroes and we count with you on the on the, on the front line and this i think is not a good uh, way to prepare for a second wave for instance mm -hmm. so i'm a bit i'm i'm globally i think it was nice to see all the channels of communication appearing and people mobilizing but i'm a bit afraid of a, a second wave I want to say uh, that uh, it was uh, it was never so clear that uh, arm reduction services are essential services, and this was uh, very clear during the the pandemics, and of course, uh, as as uh, Keros said, the role of the national health uh, services were uh, reinforced, of course, and and we all know that uh, uh, we should um, invest more in the health uh, system. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we saw some uh, difficulties in accessing uh, conventional health and social services during the pandemics. And here, I think the arm reduction services were uh, even more important uh, in uh, ensuring continuity of care and uh, in uh, linking people to, to, to the services. So this was very, very clear. And we, I, I agree with Rui that we uh, rapidly uh, reorganized the, the services and we were able to keep uh, the services open and even in some cases to expand uh, services and have new, uh, let's say, new services coming like naloxone in the community uh, for the first time in Portugal became available in our reduction uh, teams. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Lisbon, uh, we, uh, for example, uh, the city opened uh, four emergency centers for people, for homeless people, but of course, including an, uh, and a very inclusive uh, approach, including people who use drugs and uh, staff and volunteers from these emergency shelters were trained to in overdose prevention with naloxone, with nasal naloxone. So this was new. Uh, and I think there are a lot of um, positive aspects uh, in, in the integration of arm reduction services in other, uh, for example, shelters mm -hmm. that was uh, done very, very quickly. And I think with a very positive uh, outcomes. And even, I think, um, outcomes in terms of stigma uh, were positive in, in the sense that we reduced some stigma of, of people who use drugs during uh, this crisis because it was very, very, very easy to integrate these services and to recognize that some people are still using drugs or are using drugs and we need to have uh, very pragmatic uh, responses in place. And this was uh, amazing. So uh, to stress that arm reduction played a very important role, uh, not only providing arm reduction services, but in linking people to other service uh, in in a time that was difficult is even more difficult for people who use drugs to access the conventional health services is, or yeah. social services so can i add something peter yeah, sorry sure. for this because i i want to to let's say to to underline that i i i see and I perceive harm reduction services as a part of the public health system. So I think there is no distinction for me between you know, the traditional and classic uh, health um, provided services and those ones that were providing by us you know, in the real context outside on the street. So I, for me, it's the same, belongs to the same, same system. But of course, harm reduction, as you were saying, was always and it still is you know, the, the poor relative of the family. 
And, and of course, people from harm reduction uh, were capable to resist. And I agree with Wynne and the other one that they were saying that we were capable to rebuild ourselves, to re-innovate ourselves. And why is that? From my perspective, it's because we are, you know, used to live in hard con conditions, used to work in very stressed conditions. So let's say that pandemic, it was nothing completely new for professionals and for peers working on the street. And of course, because we are this, you know, extreme important pillar of health public services, um, I think that, and, and I want to underline that Adriana was now saying, and that we were showing that we are the ones that still remain with the people using drugs, with the people suffering, with the people having HIV, with the homeless people. We are still remaining there, you know, side by side with them when it's possible. And the second thing, and I, I, I think that that's quite interesting and underlining once again, at the end of giving a different perspective that you, we are um, bringing inside the traditional system the low threshold approach that we spend all the time defending. And that means, of course, fighting stigma. That means respecting, you know, the, uh, the patterns of uh, use of drugs that people have. That means, you know, to have a more humanistic approach. And I think that we can gain and this can be an opportunity to us, to, you know, to, let's say, to, to change a little bit, you know, the classic system to work with people using drugs. Mm -hmm. well, it's always interesting to speak about harm reduction in Portugal because there is an image shown in the international press about Portugal, which is like a model country. It's very successful drug policy. Drug use is decriminalized. So from looking from other countries, it sometimes it's look, look like an ideal country with ideal drug policies. But when you are speaking, you were saying that you were not very much uh, satisfied with the situation before the crisis. So uh, we could not say that that was a kind of normal situation that you would go back to, right? So it's like, uh, uh, can you just explain? So what, what were the main problems with, with harm reduction in the first place? So even before this crisis happened? Um, I don't know. Shall I start? Do you start? Uh, so I, you know, you know, it's a it's a huge fight, and you know, you know it quite better, or quite well. And but I would say a part of it, and then I will pass the note word to other colleagues so they can have them different perspectives. So, but one of them, um, it's all it was always I think one of them it was a, a structural problem. It was connected with funding. <clears throat> As you know, the Portuguese state and the other you know uh, key actors that wanted to buy, let's say harm reduction services to, to provide them to the vulnerable um, population or population living in vulnerable situations, they were, you know, they were funding this only at 80%. So there was always a lack of 20% that could, you know, help us to sustain these services that could help us, you know, to pay a proper salary to, to the professionals. So, and this is still there. We still have the problem with the funding and we want to use once again, this let's say, so-called opportunity to reinforce the importance of the you know, of sustainability of our services. That's one. And the second one, and I hope that Michael is could complement this, this part, is about you know, a, a structured dialogue with the state. So there was always a kind of opportunity to, have a, to create channels to debate and, dialogue, and to establish a dialogue with the Portuguese state, especially with some health authorities, but was never, was never in a very structured, and continuous way. And I think that now we can have once again the opportunity to establish this, you know, continuous channel that could, you know, uh, leave the opportunity to exchange best practices, to exchange different visions and to exchange different perception coming from civil society and community and the key actors of the state. But I, I'm pretty sure that maybe Adrian, you can tell us a little bit about yes. the new so, development. So, yeah. so uh, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, so what we saw during these pandemics, uh, and it was that the National Arm Reduction Network was uh, moved into a, a more important role at national level. It was reinforced, this role. Uh, and uh, there is a new uh, environment, let's say, and a new dialogue uh, uh, with the governmental agency. Um, and, and this is very interesting because we were already uh, there and now um, there is a, um, a more uh, 
on ongoing dialogue and conversation and some of the old claims of uh, of our organizations in terms in terms of of the armed action response some of the old claims and some of the new claims related to the to the crisis were finally uh, um, take, taken in, into consideration. And we think uh, these could, could, can speed up some, some changes. I already talked about naloxone, but there are also crack pipe, crack pipe distribution that was, uh, it was never funded by the state uh, uh, and other, other changes that we need to, to make not only during the pandemics, but we think that some changes were already needed. So um, there, there is this conversation. Um, it's more, it seems that now it's more easy to propose uh, and to be, to be heard, to be, uh, to have a voice. Uh, of course, we are a little bit worried uh, with the pause pandemic uh, if we are going to keep this uh, uh, this uh, dialogue and if we are uh, if we will be able to to sustain and to uh, this type of uh, changes and I, I also give an example I think it's not only in Portugal we need to change uh, the way uh, opioid substitution treatment programs work because usually it's a very punitive and uh, very um, restrictive approach. And we need to change the rules to make it more low threshold uh, approach uh, and more accessible. And, and uh, during the pandemic, some of these rules were, were changed, but we need really to change a lot of things. Uh, um, it's not only during the pandemic, so we need to, to ensure that this dialogue and these negotiations and uh, and we need to be more recognized uh, as a response, as professionals, of course. So we are a bit uh, afraid to go back uh, after the pandemic to the same place that we were before. So it's a concern uh, of our reduction people, let's say. So I don't know if Rui wants to well, ask. Well, yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with with both of you uh, uh, on the sustainability issue and on the disaccomplishment of having a structural a structured channel of communication. I I think this is. But again, I I think that uh, uh, for a, a country that that decriminalized uh, I think that there is a, a more profound structural uh, uh, way of working that doesn't in, me, meaningfully involve the actors on the field not only harm reductionists but also also community there's uh, there's uh, maybe because of having the longest dictatorship in Western Europe I, I, I think that civil society is gaining day by day much, much more influence, but still we have uh, a lack of uh, uh, real participation and, uh, and uh, nevertheless in this pandemic revealed, uh, revealed these uh, fragilities, but at the same time revealed the energy that uh, our reductionists and the community can have when a thing like this uh, happens. So uh, I, I'm not only worried with, with the post-pandemic, uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm still a bit worried on the second wave, on the probable second wave, because I think that there are still a lot of differences from city to city. And Lisbon, I guess, found a, a a very nice way of shelter of different levels of security of shelters and of specific public uh, centered shelters for trans for uh, people using drugs the different kinds of solutions but this doesn't happen across the country and i feel that 
the other cities will 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 still have a lot of difficulties if a second wave uh, with the same or more intensity comes. Um, then I I, I feel the, I, I think that uh, if we're planning for the decade for the sustainable uh, development goals, so many things we're planning for the decade. I think that uh, uh, there would be now a, a, a really good chance uh, because of what the pandemic revealed to to really unite and build a, a public national system that really addresses these more pragmatic and humanistic fields. So I'm, I hope things uh, will go that way. I'm also afraid that uh, in some way uh, uh, the second wave and uh, will we'll bring another lockdown and the second lockdown for users on mm -hmm. the streets will be uh, total genocide or something like that. We, can, can you can you also talk a bit about like how this crisis affected people who use drugs? So what was the effect, and, and maybe also what what changes you see in the market on the streets, uh, drug prices or availability? Okay, so uh, there there has been already a shortage on cannabis. Then it appeared before the pandemic, and then now with the pandemic, there's uh, it's very difficult to find. Uh, Cannabis. There's lots of uh, uh, laced uh, products, uh, but uh, good cannabis is it's very expensive. You can find a gram for 20 euros or something. So in some places, for instance, if you go to the interior where I live, uh, because of the risk of traveling with the drugs, uh, dealers will put uh, uh, an extra money. So in the interior, uh, drugs cost almost uh, always the double. Uh, but on the major cities, uh, things uh, kept accessible and the prices didn't go up. And strangely, in the first moment, there was uh, um, a feeling among users that the quality even had gotten better. Uh, not, not, it's not the case anymore. Uh, the quality is not so good now and the prices are the same and it's accessible but during the lockdown it was very hard because of uh, uh, people traveling you 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 had to have a friend in uber you know motorbike or something uh, lots of schemes had to be invented People had to, uh, to, to have a dog or a pet to go to the streets, and uh, so so it was uh, it was uh, not so easy. And the informal economy stopped, so people that lived of uh, parking cars, of uh, begging on the streets, they got uh, completely isolated and alone. Uh, people saying, "Well, I hope Corona." got me and I and I go to a shelter or I go to a hospital because my life I like this I don't want to leave so there was there, there were very desperate situations also there was places where people kept uh, gathering places uh, with no ventilation but as we still don't have a, a drug consumption room uh, lots of places uh, became became overcrowded very quickly. So I guess that uh, um, we need to put our reduction answers in these places, on the places where people are really using, on the, you know, on the backs of the cities. And, uh, and I guess that peers and uh, frontline arm reductions can be, are, are the only ones that are capable of doing this properly in a, a short term. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Um, so, so, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Drew. Yeah. So that, that that's why um, you know I was thinking that um, we really need you know to create this alliance between peers or the community of people using drugs and professionals of harm reduction. I think that once again we have the opportunity to learn with the past experience that we had you know in some countries like France, Italy, the Netherlands, even Portugal, and so on, where peers 
were working side by side with professionals, delivering, you know, uh, the services, learning with each other, exchanging practices and knowledge. And, and you know that we have a, a project called Peer to Peer when we try to map this kind of experience and we try to translate this in new opportunities and new pilots to be to be developed, for example, in Eastern countries. But I think that even now in Portugal, we need to come back once again to these old stories, to these old, old lessons and trying to implement new projects where the peers and the community could and should have you know, a, a major role uh, addressing their, 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 their own, their own uh, community. And, and I think that, for example, what we have learned about pipes in the last months with people from cows and the community, it was amazing. <clears throat> because, for example, uh, it was once again showing us how, how, how's the, how the Portuguese model, you know, the so-called victimization model, and even the harm reduction model in Portugal are totally based in this heroin model, you know, approach. So everyone is talking and it was writing and it was, you know, um, preparing the kids only for people that were shooting heroin, basically. And there was, there was always a kind of demanding and a, a complaint from community and even from professionals from harm reduction say we need to improve and to enlarge our kids. We need to, for example, include pipes and include other kind of paraphernalia so that you can address, you know, and cover all kinds of, of using that we have, uh, have seen here in Portugal. And now, finally, with COVID, we start to talk about the introduction and, and the, the uh, new definition, let's say, rearrangement of the kits, the kits that we are, you know, delivering to the people. And, and of course, peers and community, they have a major role helping us, you know, to talking about and to choose and to define what are, what are the best, you know, pipes to, to buy and to introduce in this kit. But I don't know if my colleagues they want to add something to that, because it was, I think, a very interesting experience. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, th I agree totally, and and uh, peer to peer is a good example. I have to say on on uh, uh, how this uh, combination can can be quicker, safer, and very pragmatic to 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 reach to uh, where uh, arm reduction is needed. And on the kids, uh, I agree that injectors have de decreased a lot, and. Uh, uh, in fact, we have lots of crack smokers, uh, and we have no kids uh, specific for for other uh, um, drugs. So, so this pandemic, I think, revealed. For instance, we we say to people, wash your hands, but people that are on the streets don't have where to wash their hands. So, why not develop a hygienic hand kit, and for the place of use? and for sex workers so uh, i guess this pandemic also revealed that this uh, uh, model of uh, unique kit for all that doesn't address you know we should have uh, mouthpieces for cannabis users different kinds of uh, models and uh, because people still share the the joint uh, so so i think the, the the that the channel that has been opened can can uh, can uh, help us to put these uh, grassroots questions, these questions that uh, we feel on the on the the streets, uh, and finally try to to inform deciders. So so uh, this was very very interesting to see. Yeah, I think it's very important that you mention uh, peer to peer and uh, peer involvement because it's coming up from each episode of this uh, fro mm -hmm. stories from the front lines that mm -hmm. in countries where there is a strong peer involvement mm -hmm. there are like now breakthroughs in, in in harm reduction and treatment during the epidemic uh, so th some of the barriers are broken down and uh, really in those countries where where the peer community is strong these mm -hmm. changes are happening in a much uh, better way, level and faster level so you, you, you mentioned that there are regional uh, differences in uh, Portugal about you know, access to treatment. Uh, and as far as I know, you only have uh, one uh, drug consumption facility right now in, in, uh, in Lisbon. Is that still the case? Yeah, yes, it's, it's the case. It's the, a mobile unit. It started last year uh, and um, it's planned uh, in Lisbon we will have uh, two fixed location 
uh, drug consumption rooms coming uh, probably this, e this year, but this was already planned before. So, and it's, uh, let me say something about the peers, uh, of course, uh, here in our, in our teams in GATT, uh, and of course we, uh, we have peer workers and uh, we are uh, always advocating for 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 the participation uh, of of peers in at all levels, not only at service provision, of course. Um, but um, of course, we need to to because uh, of course we need to 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 strengthen uh, the the ability of 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 peers to to organize. Uh, we need a, a stronger movement uh, from the community, of course. But just to say that this is uh, our services are involving peers, um, and the drug consumption room uh, is is uh, uh, also have peer workers. And we uh, during the pandemics uh, we managed to expand the service. Uh, as I said, we are in new locations of the city. Uh, also, because because there are some 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 new locations that need uh, the drug consumption room, but also because these new shelters, uh, um, so the mobile drug consumption room is also supporting the activity of these new shelters, and this is very important because uh, this type of response is being more and more accepted by other professionals but also by the by the community by the neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, and this is very very important in lisbon uh, it has been a very positive experience of implementing uh, the drug consumption room and we have um, been but of course this was made uh, in a participatory approach in a close negotiating with all types of partners including neighbors and local associations and and we are having a, a very very uh, positive uh, uh, experience and a lot of support from from all kinds of partners so and it's it's uh, even more clear during the pandemics that that we need to continue to operate and to expand to new locations, um, and, and that's it. Let me say about the uh, a, a bit about the the life of uh, people who use drugs in the streets. What we have uh, seen uh, here in Lisbon, it's not clear yet. Uh, uh, the, the drug uh, pattern, how, how this uh, impact the drug use patterns. We have different uh, people saying different things. For example, we saw some people uh, manage to stop using drugs during the pandemic, uh, but they, they had difficulty in accessing treatment services. So treatment services were, uh, at least in Lisbon, not accepting new clients, and this is very problematic. Uh, and even for, for uh, old clients, let's say, they were uh, not uh, having only uh, online or telephonic uh, appointments, and they reduced a lot their, their activity, the treatment cent centers. And people, uh, we saw more people asking to enter methadone uh, programs, and this was mainly done in arm reduction services. Mm -hmm. So people uh, entered methadone, low threshold methadone programs in arm reduction uh, services. But treatment services were uh, really hard to 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 reach for for people who use drugs. We saw also, and we already mentioned, uh, the informal economy was shut down, and uh, uh, a lot of um, support uh, for people who use drugs in the streets uh, disappeared. Um, 
so people have less money. And in that sense, we uh, think that uh, might, we might have a reduction in, in drug use because people don't have less money to buy drugs. But it's not clear if this also implies some riskier uh, patterns, for example, injecting more um, changes in, in the route of, of administration. We don't know also if people are using other other substances. Uh, we uh, see some benzodiazepine injection, some increase in the benzodiazepine injection because it's easier to get the pill and the cheaper. We also see that um, prices of crack cocaine and heroin remain more or less the, the same prices are more or less stable, but it's unclear if quality is, is the same. Uh, some people uh, refer and report less quality in crack cocaine, for example, but heroin, for heroin, uh, people say that the quality is more or less uh, the same, but it's, it's, we are not sure about this. There are a lot of studies going on, surveys and, and other studies. So I think we will know more in the coming month. Um, one other aspect uh, is that drug use is more, especially during the lockdown, it, it is more visible in the streets mm -hmm. and uh, for users and for dealers. And people are reporting more police harassment. Uh, so more action from the police because these are the only people in the street in the middle of the night, for example. So it's easier to spot the selling and, and drug use in the, in, the, in the street. We are also seeing more tension and more violence uh, affecting people who use drugs in the streets because there is less money uh, people, some people are also not accessing uh, some other essential services, food, housing, etc. So there is more tension and more violence in the street. Uh, I think women again are among the most uh, mm -hmm. affected by these uh, women who use drugs, <clears throat> uh, uh, who are in the street are more, even more affected by these, all these um, environments. And we know that uh, during the lockdown, less sex work, uh, but riskier sex work was, was uh, happening. And women more exposed to violence in this context also. So, uh, but it's, it's, um, we still don't know all the all the impact of, of the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we are uh, seeing, and now with the easing of the lockdown measures, uh, let let's see what 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 is going to happen. So, Peter, can I add something to this sex work issue? Yeah, because sure. there there was the, thank you, there was a um, there wasn't there there still is a movement of people um, you know having sex work or professionals of sex that that are you know uh, reclaiming in per particular in this period or reinforcing the need to have you know this work um, this acknowledgement as professionals of, of sex let's say and and because to, because it remains as an informal not acknowledged uh, profession by society so it gets impossible to them to achieve and to reach grants or uh, grants from or loan grants in particular, you know, public grants from from the state. So they don't have any kind of support, any kind of money subsidy, so they can, you know, uh, face this crisis in particular face a decrease of sex um, activity or the, or the decrease of, you know, of the clients that are not looking for them anymore because they want to protect because they are afraid and so on. So that that once again, this this show us how important this movement, this political, you know. Uh, fights that we have that reclaim um, sex work as a profession, as a work, once again as a, a pillar and an importance that could, you know, could save p 
people's lives in the future because they can be protected or not being protected by the state in, in crisis times. So I think it's very important. The second one, and, and it's a kind of, you know, derivation is the, the fact that we are also seeing that teams that are, you know, delivering methadone for two, three, four days, so people can take this methadone in a, in a self-regulated way at home, most of them, they are capable to have this um, adjust and self-regulated behavior. So most of them are capable to be autonomous and to be competent in the way they, they administrate methadone to themselves. And this is quite interesting once again, because it shows us that a, a, a great large, or uh, yes, a great large of, of the people that are, that are you know, being um, providing of methadone by the teams, they can do self-regulation at home in their own places. There is no need to force them, to oblige them to come to the band or to come to the health structures to make this, you know, um, methadone uh, use by, by medical observation. There, there is no need, there is no meaning on that, uh, uh, honestly. So once again, it, it shows that we can and we should rely on people that they are capable, most of them, they are capable to cope with their own lives and to cope with their own medicines, even if that medicine is called methadone. So that's something that we are learning. And I hope that this could be, you know, uh, let's say, uh, be reinforced and could change, you know, the mind setting of some of our uh, health professionals in Portugal. We got, uh, we got uh, three quite interesting questions from those people who are watching us in the comments. So one is that whether you know it, it uh, people from the drug user community get infected with COVID. So do you have any information about that? And then uh, if you, uh, if, if uh, Castle or other organizations did pre prepare any materials or informational leaflets for, for people who use drugs. And the third one is also interesting, like, because we were speaking about the peer uh, opinions and peer views and um, d does the policy policymakers hear the voice of peers? So, are there any any ways how you can make sure that they they hear the voice of the of the people who use that? Thank you. Well, uh, the, there's uh, uh, indirect uh, uh, evidence of impact of COVID. Uh, we don't really know people. Some people disappear. We don't know if this is. Uh, 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 because population is very uh, flex, uh, mobile, but we 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 are sure. For instance, that uh, uh, just to to go go back to this methadone issue, that I think it's uh, also uh, very important because traditionally it has been used as a, a way of control, a punitive uh, approach, and I guess that some some professionals even with the uh, changing of the law kept in their mindsets this kind of approach and uh, indeed there are uh, several most people can can uh, uh, be supported to manage their own uh, self-use and uh, at the same time uh, the services didn't uh, uh, provide uh, provided enough risk management on i have some friends that inject methadone and uh, taking two weeks methadone to, to home, this can bring a, a high risk of well-being or a, a risk of uh, using the methadone in two days and then not having methadone for the rest of the two weeks. So there, uh, the services uh, clearly weren't ready to, um, to give this accompaniment to the, to, to the beneficiaries of the, the treatments. Um, I guess that uh, harm reductionists, teams, and peers uh, kind of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 did this part that the services didn't, and uh, harm reductionists tried to complement uh, and, and do that part. Um, we, di we did, in fact, the campaign, uh, a European uh, Euro input. Uh, campaign with the leaflets on information uh, reviewed by a university and then we, we translated in to all languages and um, uh, we were giving and also 
uh, send, send Greg Reporter. The first ones, I think it was Greg Reporter leaflets that we printed and, uh, and uh, went to the places of use and take some information. But uh, for, for a, a small organization we, that is not invested by the government and that is not um, uh, invested properly uh, on a sustainable way to have a, a continuous voice of users, uh, we also are very dependent on these uh, allies, uh, on arm reduction teams that can go with us, they're where we can print the leaflets. So, uh, lots of difficulties. And again, uh, going a little back on uh, what Adriana was saying, on the uh, uh, there was an expansion of where harm reduction is useful. Uh, so, low threshold thinking and harm reduction. Uh, proved to be very useful on shelters and different contexts. But at the same time, I think that uh, uh, as, as it was an area uh, under, under invested for so many years in this second wave, maybe Lisbon is already uh, uh, very ready, but I, I think that most of Portuguese cities are not uh, ready for the second wave. We are better prepared in terms of information and we will not do some uh, some mistakes we, we did the, on the, the first wave, even when we had already uh, the good information, still some, some organizations were doing uh, some, some uh, not so good practice, uh, but, but now we have the good information but I, I'm not sure that all teams uh, have the proper investment to get ready for the second wave, to have a mirror team, to have all the important things the, uh, that can keep the, 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 uh, the teams on the front line. Because when the teams stopped working seven days and went to contingency plans and working two, three days a week, we could see in some parts of Porto, for instance, users being beaten by the, the local neighborhood people and uh, events that wouldn't happen if there were more eyes on the streets and if uh, arm reduction teams were, were there. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank Do you. The, the others maybe want to add something? Also on this uh, issue of how we can make sure that the peer voice is better heard. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, of course, some of the structural problems of arm reduction uh, and arm reduction in a larger, not only service, but people who use drugs uh, remain. Uh, and one of the structural problems in Portugal is participation. Uh, I think, uh, we uh, must uh, keep uh, advocating for uh, more participation of the arm reduction movement, not only service providers, but people who use drugs uh, as well, and peer workers. And uh, we, we must uh, continue this, this uh, fight, let's say. Um, let me say that the uh, National Arm Reduction Network also includes CASO. Uh, also includes CASO. So we are all together uh, fighting for better services, better policies, and also uh, for the recognition of peer work, for example, or the recognition of the arm reduction professionals because they are not uh, recognized as well. Uh, so uh, I think the, we, we must continue. So let me say that uh, we are also uh, very much concerned, not only a, a second wave, but uh, the huge uh, social and economic crisis that is coming. Um, this is very relevant also uh, because we know we have a fresh memory from the, the, the crisis, the economic crisis some years ago. It's still fresh. Um, and we know that uh, the way the national governments and European at European level, level as well 
the way the last crisis was, was the, uh, it was not uh, good for the most vulnerable people. Uh, so we see that high employment, high unemployment, uh, access to social benefits, access to health, it, this was all impact, uh, uh, impacted by, by the social and economical crisis. So we are afraid of what is coming and what will be the response of national governments uh, and also European um, Commission and all this. So um, can be um, worse than the pandemics, you know, in terms of lives, mm -hmm. in terms of, so we are a bit um, concerned. Yeah, I think that Adriana, she said that this social and economic crisis is coming, and I would say she's already here. And so, and we can see it in all the way that, you know, the, the money is not, the money that should come from, you know, from social protection that the Portuguese state is saying that is, you know, delivering to the people is not reaching, in fact, the people. It's not reaching the enterprises, it's not reaching the, the people that are losing their work, it's not reaching families and so on. And of course, and of course, the last ones of the chain, and I would say the, the, a little bit above them, it's the harm reduction professionals, and I, I'm not being, I'm not victimizing myself. And then we have, of course, the most vulnerable ones, or the people living in the most vulnerable situations. So the people living in homeless situations, sex workers, uh, people that are releasing from prisons, the, the people using drugs, the foster child, and so on. They will be always the last ones in the chain. And of course, they will be the, always the last one, you know, receiving any kind of social protect, protection coming from society in general. And you can see, for example, that, that you know, the way that the European Union was designing before the crisis, was designing the, the support to the social cohesion, and in particular to the people living in, the, in these deprived con conditions, was not even, you know, considered was not even considered, for example, people suffering and living with HIV, was not considered drug users related problems, was not considered homeless people. And that was already, you know, a, a main um, concern for all of us. So I, I think that now, you know, with that, with that, with this idea that I, with this fact that Adriana was underlining that the, the social and economical crisis is coming, that is already here, I would say that we have another one that, that it came to my mind now, it's, you know, about nationalism, it's about, you know, the, the idea that we can lose our international connections, that we can lose our international movement, that we can lose, you know, our international in community internet, interconnection. I think that one of the things that we have learned with the harm reduction movement and with the peers movement and so on, it was that when we were capable to surpass and to um, across our frontiers, our borders, and, and we were you know, open to learn with each other experience from other countries, we were reinforcing ourselves as a community and we will reinforce ourselves uh, as an international uh, community with a proper identity that was capable to defend themselves you know, from the, the most, let's say, conservative and author author authoritarian governments, as for example, you are facing in Hungary. And I'm, I'm really afraid that, you know, we can forget that and we can, you know, stay day by day in our national concerns and, you know, not realizing that when we are together, when we have, you know, this kind of international movement, we are stronger. So one of the things that I really hope is that COVID and and the pandemic situation and economic crisis will not, you know, push us to the interior of our frontiers and to the to the fear and to the oppression that comes with nationalism. So I really hope that we can fight that and we will not forget to stay with each other and stay together. So that's one of the lessons, not a lesson, I think, a kind of a warning that I would say, you know, that I would like to to underline once again. Yeah, that's uh, actually a nice kind of closing remark also, but we are approaching the end of our uh, one hour. Uh, you know, as, as a historian, I often wonder actually if we can speak about crises in history or maybe, you know, crisis is just the normal state of our society and mm -hmm. it is just interrupted by short periods of peaceful times or mm -hmm. stable periods. So, sure. um, yeah. It, do you do you have any any other like uh, closing remarks recommendations which you would maybe uh, uh, 
don't want to miss the opportunity to tell to other harm reduction people in, in other countries or policymakers. If any of you have, just please go ahead. Well, I, I, I would uh, recommend to, to read the, the letter, the open letter of Ariel from Norway. He was one of the first uh, guys to, to, to claim attention and uh, uh, alert to, to peers and to users. And uh, in fact, the, the, the most vulnerable uh, people are not very well connected to the systems. So I, I guess uh, crisis can, can mean also this opportunity to build the channels of communication to include the peers in these platforms of arm reduction teams. And so that uh, the, the step by step we keep together because uh, what Queiroz was saying, I feel uh, it's very important that uh, this togetherness keeps, uh, keeps uh, driving our movement. Okay, thank you very much, Adriana, Jose, and uh, Hui to, for being with us. And uh, thanks to those who were watching us from home on Facebook. And uh, this was Stories from the Frontlines, a drug reporter. And I hope uh, next week we also have, a, we will also have a video uh, session and this time about uh, French uh, harm reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter to find out more about the next episodes of this show. Stay informed and stay safe. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.